I've been making games with Python for 12 years now, and there's no concrete standard or guide for structuring code for games made with Pygame or other Python modules. People have been asking me about code organization and structure for a long time. Even as far back as I was putting all my code in one file and calling it a day, yes I shipped multiple games like this, back then I was very hesitant to talk about code structure because one, obviously putting everything in one file is not the best of ideas for larger projects, and two, I didn't have any strong opinions from experience yet. Several years later, after shipping bigger games and working on even wilder stuff, I can safely say that I have some thoughts on code structure for Python game dev. I'm going to start with the why for the code structure techniques I use and then cover the how of the implementation since the reason constantly drives how I implement things. The topics in this video will apply to all Python game development including Pygame, although most Python game dev is done with Pygame still. When thinking about code structure methodology, it's important to consider why having intent behind code structure is useful. Ultimately, it comes down to improving development speed and quality. If code structure attempts are not having those effects, you should probably reevaluate your code structure, unless you're just organizing for the fun of it. It sounds obvious, but blindly applying the commonly praised object-oriented programming principles like inheritance or encapsulation can oftentimes lead to self-inflicted headaches as you continue to expand your code base. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the encapsulation principle. Straight from Wikipedia, in software systems, encapsulation refers to the bundling of data with the mechanisms or methods that operate on the data. And also, essentially, encapsulation prevents external code from being concerned with the internal workings of an object. When you get into object-oriented programming with classes and such in Python, encapsulation arises naturally to a degree. While Python doesn't have private variables to hide object internals, it does have scope, which can hide objects from each other. Let's say you've got a game object that contains a reference to a player object and enemy objects that it updates. Makes sense, right? But now your player object can't find the enemy objects for collisions because they aren't in the same scope. So what's the natural solution that many people jump to? Dependency injection, of course. This is when you pass references for any dependencies an object might need directly to the object in question so that it can access them. In a lot of cases, this is an okay solution, but this is where I shot myself in the foot with object-oriented programming for the first time when I was trying to force it into my game Vagrant a while back. I quickly found that software principles are not universal in structural application. Games are on an extreme case when it comes to code structure. They're oftentimes simulations. You know what a useful way to describe simulations is? Everything interacts with everything and we see what happens. Before you know it, you've got your player object being initialized with the enemies collection, the items collection, the terrain object, the portals collection, the VFX collection, and an endlessly increasing list of the everything that the player interacts with in the simulation. Other software oftentimes has at least a more naturally organized hierarchy of objects that have much more limited dependencies that fit better into encapsulated scopes. When I saw my dependency injection is piling up and I didn't even know that there was a term for it at the time, I chose the next logical step, which is to just give the player a single reference to the game object where it could access whatever it needed in the game. Encapsulation is now crying in the corner, but the solution saved a tremendous amount of time. While I was working on Vagrant, I decided to try and learn the Godot game engine and make a game during a game jam. It was tough to get used to working with an engine, but it resulted in a pretty cool time lapse where you can actually see me looking stuff up and learning Godot as I make a game in 48 hours. Anyways, I noticed something interesting in Godot that shared some similarities with what I had seen in Unity a while back. Godot makes use of a node tree that contains everything while every node has access to the tree so that they can look up other objects in the game. It turns out that object scope is already a largely solved problem in game dev, and the solution is just to make everything globally accessible, but under some implementation that doesn't cause accidental access. In Godot, nodes can have children too, so you can find objects by their absolute locations in the node tree, or relatively as if it were a file system on your computer. It turns out that this is quite a useful structure for 3D games since the math for handling transformations actually composes transformations using all parent transformations of an object. A weapon's parent may be the player's hand, whose parent is the arm, whose parent is the player, whose parent is the horse being ridden, and so on. In 2D I find that spatial parenting isn't as common and the whole tree structure doesn't come up quite as much, so I ultimately landed on a much more flat object structure, which I ended up also using for my VR game anyways. Before I get into the specifics of code structure implementation, I'd like to say a few more things about the idea of object-oriented principles. In addition to games being much more interconnected than most other software, the actual code is naturally highly subject to change. 
Oftentimes you'll play test the game and change your mind about a feature during development. It's not good to have an overly rigid game design plan, and likewise it's going to be a headache if your code is overly encapsulated and abstracted under the assumption of a specific design. Spending a lot of time tying up your objects in neat little bows can suck up precious development time and discourage needed but unexpected changes to the game design, leading to a loss in development speed, the game's quality, or even both. I feel that there is no simple trick to knowing the correct level of encapsulation and abstraction. Of course, doing the right implementation of abstraction is very important, but you develop an intuition through experiences where you said, oh, I could have saved some time here by making this feature reusable, or oh, I can't find what I'm looking for because there's too much interconnected spaghetti in here, or even, oh, I just wrote this great pathfinding system, but now I have to start from scratch because the frog enemy can jump. Another principle I'd be careful with is inheritance. Game development seems like a great case for inheritance, where you can actually have your dog and your other animals that could all inherit from the animal class. But then you add a vehicle system where bike and skateboard inherit from vehicle, and you want to ride a horse and the whole world crashes down around you. Favoring composition over inheritance where a horse has an animal and a vehicle in the code structure is generally a safer bet if you're not certain about your game design. Inheritance has a lot of value in statically typed languages where a typed common interface is useful, but Python doesn't care. Although inheritance still has perfectly valid use cases in Python. As a general perspective on organization, I have a video on why in a lot of cases, especially if you're working solo, you won't reap benefits from spending time making nice code for games. If nobody else has to look at your code, you don't have to make your code super intuitive. If you have a clear end of support date, you can take out loans of technical debt and declare bankruptcy when the game is done to save a ton of time. All right, with a lot of my thoughts out of the way, let's get into the how for how I implement code structure nowadays. First, as I mentioned before, I use a flat globally accessible object collection. If you look at many of my recent games, since I include the code with nearly all of them, you'll see that I inherit from Element Singleton for objects I intend to have one of that I want to access by name. The constructor of these classes inherit registers the element automatically using the class name so any other element or element singleton can reference it. I can also just import the elements file and access the elements outside of the classes too. Usually elements that there are several of are managed by a single owning object that can be looked up by name. These objects are more than just collections too, since many games have specialized optimized object queries like looking up all the terrain that should be shown on screen. Collections of objects that all have update and render functions with varying support for optimized queries is what makes up a large portion of my structural code in my games. The game's update loop normally just runs through the updates on collections. Organized updates where everything can access everything is a very simulation-oriented approach in my mind. I almost never have to spend time sorting out issues of who has access to what anymore. This isn't the most elegant solution though. I've toyed around with overriding the built-in get attribute function instead of using strings to save some characters recently too. The one annoyance I have is that IDs can't determine what object I'm looking up, so they don't have suggestions and autocomplete for function names and parameters. The simple solution to solve this is to have a globally accessible references object that instantiates objects directly or just has type hints on the attributes so that the IDE knows what's going on. The downside is that instantiating everything in an object that you want everything to have access to can create circular imports if you're not careful. While an IDE indexable solution is probably the best solution, I feel it's splitting hairs at a certain point, and the element registry has been a sufficient solution I've just habitually stuck with since it works. Now that we have an object access system, we can take a look at the question of what should even be in a class, and how should files be split? Generally, I make anything that has a strong association between functions and data a class, especially if the data is local to instances, like enemies. I might have a file that contains a bunch of mathematical utility functions, for example, but I generally extend the ranges of what should be a class to include most things including the HUD or the user input system. There's a lot of wiggle room for preference here, though. When it comes to files, I generally have a top-level script that starts the game in the top folder, along with a data folder where all the sounds, images, fonts, and stuff like that go, and a scripts folder with the rest of the code. Under the scripts folder, I like to just do some amount of organization into folders, just to make stuff easier to find. For example, all the entity implementations might go into the same subfolder, along with their component dependencies that are unique to them. When it comes to picking which file class definitions go in, I just pick what makes sense so that I can find them later. 
If a file has too many objects to quickly scroll through, I might split it up. If an object itself is too big, it may be a sign that more composition of objects should be used to break it up, but not always. A lot of organizations shouldn't change much functionally or in implementation. So the main thing you gotta watch out for is just circular imports. Remember that I use searchability as my main metric rather than something like line count. A lot of it's very situational. Ultimately, my philosophy on code structure is to ask whether it's saving me time, if bad code is causing too many bugs that waste my time, or I'm having to rewrite stuff because I didn't implement an obvious abstraction, that's a problem. As I've already discussed, spending too much time on your structure and abstraction can also waste your time. If what you're doing is working for you and your team if you have one, then you're winning. I've mentioned this before, but there's a saying that there are two types of game developers. Game developers that write good code, and game developers who release games. Games like Minecraft and Undertale are famous for having messy code bases, and they did just fine. My day job is writing safety-critical software running on rockets, and it really puts game dev into perspective. A bug from messy code in a game is a minor annoyance in the day of a player, but a bug in other software like at my job could lead to a Falcon Heavy crashing into a city. The code structure and organization techniques that you use should be specialized to the discipline that you're in, and I think that game dev should be fun. If you have your own thoughts on code structure, I'd like to see them below. A lot of the books and stuff out there don't really apply well to game development, so I'm always curious to hear what's working for people shipping games. Before I go, I thought I'd quickly go through some related topics. Entity Component Systems, or ECS. I'm aware of it, but I've not used it. I can see how you could use it for everything and how it'd be particularly useful in some projects, but I haven't really needed it myself yet. It may be worthwhile to consider for your project, though. Type hinting. I hate it, but mostly because I work solo. It takes a decent amount of time to write out the types for everything, and many Python tricks I use aren't valid under a statically typed type system anyways. In larger teams, I can see it being helpful when multiple people need to understand the same code, although I would also consider doing a hybrid approach if I were in a team where critical, frequently reused code is typed. Code style. Style is not particularly impactful, but I do like a lot of recommendations in the PEP8 style guide. If you look at my code, I mostly follow it. Import style. Importations can be considered a subsection of code style, but they do stand out as being a lot more impactful. I highly recommend avoiding wildcard imports with an asterisk since it hides from the text of the file where objects are coming from, and it can create accidental conflicts. If there are only one or two objects that I'm importing, I'll do a from import to get them directly by name. Otherwise, I think it's nice to do a from import on the file, so the file objects are namespaced under the file name. This makes it clearer whenever they're used exactly where they came from, but it's slightly more verbose. Source control. Please use source control. Once you learn Git, it only takes a tiny fraction of your time to keep it up. Even working alone, I frequently use it to look back and see when I changed something or how something used to work. It ends up saving me time in the long run, plus it's got backups bundled into it if you push it somewhere like GitHub. Alright, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for watching.